Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video we're going to look at the RRSP a little bit more. Specifically the topic we're going to cover here is the RRSP on death. Now it's important to note that um, the RRSP on death rules apply in an almost identical matter. It's not quite identical but so close that it works for our purposes to the RIF to the LIF and to the LIRA. So all of those plans are treated in a nearly identical manner on death and really like I say close enough for our purposes here. The differences are, are pretty subtle. So if you have somebody who dies with any of these, with any amount in an RRSP, RIF, LIF or LIRA, then that amount is fully taxable at death. There's no capital gains treatment. There's no ACB. You're just going to pay tax on the full amount at death. So if you have, let's say, $200,000 in one of these registered plans at death, that would just be added to income. If you remember the marginal tax rates and how the marginal tax rates work, this would, of course, push any taxpayer in any province into the highest marginal tax rate, excepting, of course, the ultra-high tax rates that we now see in Ontario. But really, we're going to have the highest marginal tax rate. So typically, we're going to have tax somewhere around 44 or 45% on that. It'll cost you about $90,000 just to die. And there would be about $110,000 remaining for the estate. approximately. It might not quite work out exactly like that, but that's a, a rough approximation. Okay, so there are some ways to manage this tax burden a little bit. It is possible with an RRSP, with any of these registered plans, to name a beneficiary. Naming a beneficiary here is similar, but not identical to naming a beneficiary in a life insurance policy. Differences here are that, or similarities, are that it's still this direct flow. So we still bypass the will and probate processes. However, you're still going to have to deal with the claims of creditors potentially on this uh, beneficiary designation. So you don't get to bypass claims of creditors, and of course, it's not automatically tax free. So there are a couple ways, though, by naming specific beneficiaries that we can get some tax advantages. And the first is if we name a spouse or common law partner as beneficiary, then we have the opportunity for a tax free rollover. And that's a fairly automatic process. It is possible for the spouse to elect out of that tax-free rollover and have the um, estate incur the tax burden, but normally what's going to happen here is the spouse and the estate will accept this tax-free rollover, and that just means, in this case, this full $200,000 would be added to the spouse's registered plan. So add it to the RRSP or the RIF, or under some circumstances, it might have to be added to a locked-in plan, a LIF or a LIRA, but for the most part, it's just going to be RRSP or RIF. Okay, so then there is one more set of opportunities that arises here, one more situation where we can name a beneficiary and get an advantage. It's a little bit tougher, but it is possible to name, now we can name any beneficiary at all. To be perfectly clear, you can name whoever you want as beneficiary, but the problem is that we don't bypass the tax burden. The estate is going to have this tax burden that we've seen up here, regardless of who you name as beneficiary, unless we've seen you name your spouse or common law partner, or if you name a minor child as beneficiary, and this could include a grandchild, 
in order for this to happen, this minor child or grandchild would have to be financially dependent, which is basically that there's a degree of dependence between the deceased and the child, so it would have to be financially dependent. And if we name a minor child, there is now an annuitization requirement. That is, this minor child cannot keep this money forever. So this next bit's a little bit tricky, but basically what happens here is this money has to be out of the registered plan by the time the minor child reaches the age of 18. So what do we mean here? Well, let's say we have the same $200,000 passed to a, let's go with a 15 year old. So at age 15, at age 16, at age 17, and depending on how we calculated this, at age 18, but let's just go with three years here, so the year that this kid turns 18, they would in each of those years have to take out $66,000 they would have $66,000 of income from this registered plan. In each of those three years, the plan has to be exhausted by the time this kid turns 18. So now we have no money in there at all. This is all going to be fully taxable to that minor child. However, you can see the advantage here that instead of having $200,000 of income taxed all at one time, which puts us in this very high tax bracket, now you have $66,000 of income taxed three times. Presumably our minor child doesn't have a lot of other income, so we can make this work fairly easily. We take that $66,000 and probably we're going to end up at about a 25 to 30% tax rate depending on which jurisdiction we're in. Even in the worst case here at a 30% tax rate, we're only losing around 20,000 of that to tax and we would lose that three times. That's about a $60,000 total tax bill as opposed to the $90,000 total tax bill that we dealt with up here. Okay, so we have one other planning opportunity, and this is actually a planning opportunity that has grown a little bit more robust in recent years. It is also possible to name a disabled. The actual wording for this in the Act, in the Income Tax Act, is infirm, but it really means disabled. If we have a disabled child, again, or grandchild, and once again, we have to have this degree of financial dependence. Then we can roll this over. We can roll funds to this child. This time, there is no annuitization requirement meaning basically the child can keep the money in a sort of quasi-registered plan right up until the date of death. So new, no annuitization required. They can kind of keep the money in their own sort of registered plan. And we can actually put up to $200,000 not because that happens to be the amount we're dealing with, that's just the rule in general, into the child's RDSP, into the Registered Disability Savings Plan. Of course, you might have seen our video series covering the Registered Disability Savings Plan, and you would know then that $200,000 is the lifetime limit for contributions to the RDSP anyways. So here we've covered the RRSP on death. It's a fairly important concept to recognize because it does generate a substantial tax liability on death and that substantial tax liability 
is something that a lot of people haven't fully considered when they're saving funds in their registered plans. Of course, we know that the RRSP and RIF are the primary source of retirement savings for many Canadians. So I hope this helps you to understand the tax consequences of dying with funds in a registered plan. This is an important concept. It's one that shows up on many financial services exams and practically in real life, it's something you're going to have to deal with. Thank you very kindly. And if you have any questions, please do let me know.